Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Sarah Siegel, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Nadifa Mohammed discussing her novel, The Fortune One. She's joined in conversation tonight by Danao Mengestu. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on Zoom and as always, our event schedule appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, uh, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk today, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. You should also be able to access closed captioning by clicking the button on your screen as well. If you'd like to buy a copy of The Fortune Men, there'll be a link in the chat where you can purchase it. All sales for this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you for your support of community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link to donate in the chat if you'd like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible, and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Now, I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Nadifa Mohammed was born in 1981 in Hargeisa, Somaliland. At the age of four, she moved with her family to London. She's the author of Black Mamba Boy and The Orchard of Lost Souls. She's received both the Betty Trask Award and the Somerset Mom Award. And in 2013, she was named one of Granta's best of young British novelists. Her work appears regularly in The Guardian and the BBC. A fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, she lives in London. Danao Mengestu, a recipient of the 2012 MacArthur Foundation Award, was born in Ethiopia and raised in Illinois. His fiction and journalism have been published in The New Yorker, Granta, Harper's, Rolling Stone, and The New York Times. Mengestu was chosen for the 535 Award by the National Book Foundation and was named on The New Yorker's 20 under 40 list in 2010. He is also the recipient of a Lannan Fiction Fellowship, the Guardian First Book Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, among other awards. He is the author of three novels, The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears, How to Read the Air, and All Our Names. His work has been translated into more than 15 languages. Today, they are discussing the fortune men. In Cardiff, Wales in 1952, Mahmoud Matan, a young Somali sailor, is accused of a crime he did not commit, the brutal killing of Violet Folaki, a shopkeeper from Tiger Bay. At first, Mahmoud believes he can ignore the fingers pointing his way. He may be a gambler and a petty thief, but he is no murderer. But as the trial draws closer, his prospect for freedom dwindles. Now Mahmoud must stage a terrifying fight for his life with all the chips stacked against him, a shoddy investigation, an inhumane legal system, and most evidently, pervasive and deep-rooted racism at every step. A haunting tale of miscarried justice, the fortune man offers a chilling look at the dark corners of our humanity. Without further ado, I will turn things over to our speakers. Nadifa, Danao, the virtual podium is yours. All right. um, thank you, Sarah, for uh, introducing us and for having us and for um, bringing Nadifa to this uh, wonderful virtual event um, at Harvard Bookstore, which uh, I'm sure like many people, I hope to return to some point soon. Um, Nadifa, it's so wonderful to see you. We were just uh, chatting. Hi, yeah, um, I, and to all the people out there who we can't see, but who we know are there, um, welcome. Um, we were just saying in the background that it's been 10 years since we last saw each other, even though we, I was, as Sarah was noting our biographies, I, was, I, I forgot just how, um, yeah. how similar, <laughs> yeah, I know. We were born very close to each other. I'm a little, I got a few years yeah. under, um, and left <laughs> not in, many. In, um, not many, but still. Um, and I was wondering, you know, in, in the 10 years since, since we first, um, since we last met, the world has obviously changed in many different ways. And um, obviously we'll continue to do so. And one of the ways in which I sort of was thinking about this novel and all the different things that it takes under its wings and all of the challenges and sort of social issues that it addresses 
um, while still very much being a, a, a literary novel um, that is vested in characters and world and um, and the complexity of the interior lives of the people that you imagine so so brilliantly. Um, but also I was, I, I was tempted and sort of wanted to ask maybe from the beginning, in what ways was this novel shaped by, or was it shaped by just this sort of, this particular sort of crucible that we have been in, um, definitely, you know, over the past three, four or five years. Um, and do you imagine that? Do you see it as a conversation that's been shaped by the particular moments and currents that we're under? Or is it something that you feel like you would have produced regardless of space and time? I think probably the latter. So I first came across the story of Mahmoud Matan in 2004. So a very different political climate and global climate. And even then, I was struck by these questions I had about who he was, why this happened to him, um, why was he in Cardiff in the 1950s, why was my father um, in Britain at the same time. So this has been a long simmering idea for me. And I, I've, the last few years have been terrible, both in the UK and in the US. But maybe what's even more depressing about that is how those the, the things that we find particularly terrible have just been in the background, whether mm. that's the way that migrants have been treated in the UK and in the US, or this crass kind of politics, which is there to appeal to people's resentments um, and prejudices. And that was, I think, evident to me in 2004. So I, I kind of kept myself in, in a bubble while working on this novel and researched it hard um, and tried to understand the way it was in the in the 50s. But it was very difficult to ignore the, the parallels between what Mahmoud was going through and what many people still go, go through now. Yeah. And do you, do you as, as, as the book was sort of forming and taking shape and you were watching, obviously, you know, um, it, it was almost like the world is kind of bending to a certain degree to come to some of the same, same conclusions that you had already known and were aware of for a very long time. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering how that feels then to see that, to see the sort of, you know, wonderful rapturous sort of attention and, you know, the nomination for the book or all of the sort of accolades that have come with the book. Um, do you think they would have been that we would have been that, the, that that our culture would have been primed to see it the same way right that the book was the, yeah mm. and one may be that i can't answer because i'm too close to the book yeah. it's always my child <laughs> so you, you can't think about it and um do I, I i always thought it was an important story but whether the outside world would have thought it was an important story if the things that happened last year hadn't happened I think so. I think um, there's always an appetite for historical novels that are both local and global. And I think The Fortune Men is that. Yeah. And it's not, I think in Britain at least, there's a real desire for novels that make you feel good at the end. You know, however bad things have come, have gone, um, there's some sort of resolution and a feeling that we're, we're going in the right direction. And I don't think <laughs> the Fortune Men offers that. So I, I actually thought the reverse. I thought that it would not be popular right now because it doesn't give the answers that people really need, the feeling that they're yeah. good, good people and we're going in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if anything, it almost does the opposite, right? It actually, it shows the scale of the problem over mm -hmm. a lens of time and a space of time that I think sometimes people are even more resistant, right? Sometimes it's easier if we think of our problems in this moment as just this moment. Yeah. And instead, this novel does this interesting job of actually shining sort of very long spotlight on on what's been happening. Um, and you and said that something really- attachment helps, you know, it helps yeah. in certain ways where it's a historic, you know, 70 years ago, so you feel as if that's something that couldn't have happened now, but but it does, you know, um, the legal system is probably even more discriminatory now than it was then in the UK. Um, but for people who are genuinely resistant, they always go back to the same question of, well, why don't you leave this country? If this country yeah. is so bad, why don't you leave? And that's definitely something I've heard since The Fortune Men has been published in the UK. Yeah. 
And and yet what's so remarkable about those responses in the comments is, you know, something what you had just said a second ago, right? It's both local and global. And one of the most sort of remarkable things in reading this novel was actually seeing, you know, this version of 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 the UK recast, you know, this historical lens cast in a way that you rarely ever get to see, right? You sort of see the historical ideals of oftentimes European countries, and they tend to seem like, oh, the world was really monolithic uh, mm. back then, and immigration is this thing that has just sort of happened now. Yeah. And in fact, you give us this sort of incredible portrait of, of Cardiff in, in the 1950s that upends, I think, so many um, conventions and expectations of what the world actually looked like, because we don't see that version represented rarely, if ever. Absolutely. And despite, you know, me studying history at university, this wasn't a world that I knew about. It's not something that you are easily presented with. And, you know, the story of migration to the UK goes even earlier than the 1950s mm. to the mid 18th century, if not before, you know, we're talking about different um, eras and uh, movements. And there's a fantastic book called Black Tudors by Miranda Kaufman, which looks at um, black, the black presence in Britain over the centuries. And, you know, you had black women living in the middle of nowhere in the countryside in England in the 1500s and buried in these tiny cemeteries across the country. So it's, it's something that maybe even I haven't really got the scale of, but because my father was one of these men who arrived in the 1940s, I had this connection to it. And Mahmoud was someone that my father knew. It felt all very familiar, but also strange because uh, Tiger Bay, uh, I didn't grow up in Cardiff, I grew up in London and there's a particular flavor to Cardiff, I think. Um, and the way that migration, the way that the, the shipping fleets, the empire all coalesced in this tiny district of you know, square mile across the centuries, across the decades um, from, eight, from 19th into the 20th is really fascinating and pretty unusual. Yeah, I, I mean, whoops. <laughs> One of those technical problems is when your uh, <laughs> AirPods fall out. Um, one of the wonderful things you do, though, is the way you populate Tiger Bay um, and the way it's, you know, both you sort of bring to life this representation of, of the UK in this period that you rarely sort of see. But even beyond that, you know, that's something that I think, you know, um, a historian can do. But you populate it, right? You bring it, you make it alive in this sort of really sort of textured way where it's the series of relationships mm -hmm. that exist in this community between Mahmoud and the other people, between Berlin, between the people that he's robbed from, um, between his you know, ex-wife. It's such a complicated space, even though it's quite small, it's mm -hmm. nonetheless enormously there. So I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about how, you know, you mentioned the research about how you construct and sort of build this incredibly complex global world in this very small provincial place. Yes, and I think that was helped by the fact that this is the first novel that I've written that's set just in the UK. It, it does actually go to other places, but most of the action takes place in the UK. So then you have the archives, which I don't have when I'm writing about Somalia, Somaliland. Yeah. And the case file for this uh, particular incident was available to me. So it's from the very first police interviews with Mahmoud to the last bits of uh, bureaucracy before he's executed, it was all there. And then the newspapers, including the newspapers that covered the appeal, his conviction was quashed in 1998. So there was lots of press coverage at the time, but also to go back and read those newspapers at the British Library um, from the 1950s was really fascinating. And that's probably, I think, where I started to understand Tiger Bay. I wasn't reading just about his case. It was all of the incidental things um, half of which couldn't go into the book because there were so many, but um, the, the, the boy at the beginning of the novel um, was mentioned who was flogged by his teacher and his mom decided to take the teacher in school to court for assault because it had been such a terrible flogging. That was very new. That, that was also another sign that Britain was changing and the old brutality that had become quite normal was starting to be challenged. Um, lots of funny things or the arrival of Ethiopian princesses um, mm. to study at a secretarial school in Wales. So 
all, all of these things, I think, really en enabled me to get back into that era and into that place. So I loved it. You know, I think that was one of the most enjoyable aspects of the novel was immersing myself in this familiar, but not quite familiar, you know, the, the adverts for yoga in, in Cardiff in the mm. 1950s in the newspapers. I didn't <clears> even know that was a thing. Um, it was an easy place to become enamored with. And I, I think, I hope that that came through in, in the novel. Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it, and, it be, and it comes through partly because it's a world that, even as it's a world sort of made up of, of people who have come there from all parts of the world, um, it's not their reality in that space and the way they interact and engage with each other and with one another isn't dependent purely upon the kind of ideas of migration, right? It actually starts, it moves into some sort of space beyond them where they create a network and a culture and a community that's tense and oftentimes at odds with one another. Um, you know, I'm thinking about my mood sort of learning how to speak just enough words of Hindi in order to be able to go gamble, right? It's like those little sort of small details that I'm wondering if they come from research or, or, or if those are things that for you began to kind of uh, populate themselves. No, a lot of it was factual. So um, it's the police that a lot of this um, information comes from. And they asked Mahmoud, can you speak Arabic? He says, yes. Can he read Arabic? No. Um, he speaks a bit of Swahili, Hindi, English, and Somali, so five languages in, in total. And that enabled me to think, okay, so he must have probably gone to Aden quite a bit, because that was just across the Red Sea from where he lived. Um, and he must have traveled south um, to get to the merchant navy. My father went north to Egypt, but Mahmoud went south. And that's why he picked up Swahili, because he was passing through Kenya and Tanzania and other Swahili speaking countries and I was right and his first ever arrest was in northern, northern Rhodesia as it was um, when he was arrested for not having the right papers when he was trying to get to South Africa. So all of these small details gave away I think a, a wider bigger sense of his life and the decisions he had made in his life and also his personality his character. He's speaking to the police in a way that has shows no fear he tells them the moment they come into his boarding house the night of the murder that all police are liars and that they're making it up that it's a black man that they're looking for. So I think that feistiness um, came from him feeling he knew more about the world than they did. He'd seen more of the world. So why are these stupid Welsh policemen telling me anything? And that was also part of his downfall. The fact that he didn't quite guess at the danger he was in until it was too late. No, he's he he is he, he is such a a complicated and at times challenging and at times frustrating character. And um, you know, one of the interesting things is as he's sort of in opposition and in confrontation with this sort of world. Nonetheless, he's still and he's aware, obviously, of the you know the many degrees of racism that exists in society. But yet, he maintains for a long time this idea that the truth will set him free. Yeah. Yes, which and, I guess, and, mm -hmm. no, go, go on. I guess most of us, if we were wrongfully arrested, would think the same, that sooner or later, you know, someone will tell the authorities something that will absolve me of any involvement of this crime. And he had been through the legal system just enough to have false confidence in it. Um, he passed through, passed through it for quite petty crimes um, and, apart from the last incident where he'd stolen some money from the mosque, he'd generally got away with things. And the, the courts had impressed on him a feeling that they were not out to get him, that they could be fair in a, in a country that otherwise was not fair for people like him. And he had also been a court interpreter, so that had given him some feeling of being someone in control of the, of the system, part of the system. His wife, Laura, I remember her, her saying much later in the 1990s when she was interviewed that she thought that he sometimes forgot that he was black. Mm. That's how she put it. And by that, she, I think she meant that the limitations that he was meant to accept, uh, he just could not accept. And the, the survival instinct that probably other black men had, he just didn't seem to have. Yeah. I mean, in part because he wasn't black until he came to the UK. True. Yeah, I think that's probably yeah. quite true. Yeah. 
I mean, up until then, he was just a man. I mean, he was Somali. He was in his community. He was Somali. He was many he, things. Yeah, yeah. He, he was his clan, first and foremost. That's what he spent most of his life being in Somalia. But he grew up just after the end of a, a very vicious uh, colonial war between Somalis and the British, um, right. which ended in mass starvation and all sorts of uh, difficulties. So, and I think that that hostility to the British was also there, that, that push and pull where mm. a lot of people were very hostile to the British and um, thought they were other, had to be kept away. Um, but then he, he did the crazy thing of marrying one of them and, and living there. So I'm guessing that he was trying to, he was flipping back and forth between those two postures of, um, I'm just a man in, in love with a woman, a free man, I can do what I want. And also, mm, I'm not, I'm a black man in a colonial yeah. country um, where I know my life is not worth that much. Yeah. And by the end, but just before his um, execution, when he writes his last letter, testimony, or dictates it to the policeman who's framed him for this murder, he says, I know that my, my life is cheap because I'm black. Maybe now would be a great time to ask you to, to read um, a section from the novel. Sure. They have let Mahmoud out into a private yard for his daily exercise, and he feels brought back to life. The day is warm, almost hot for the first time in a long time, but with the fresh green scent of drying rain still in the air. The light is harsh and washes over the damp brick walls and ironmongery of the prison like varnish. Everything feels new and clean. Even the barbed wire above his head glitters with raindrops hanging from the twisted points. Mahmoud closes his eyes and lets the sunshine pour over his face like holy oil. A guard watches him idly from the entrance, but Mahmoud has space all around him, space to think, to feel, to remember who he really is beyond his prison number. The walls reach just over his head, and if he had the courage, he would lift himself over and run through the many quadrants, green spaces and gates of the jail and the short distance to Laura and the children. He hasn't seen her for more than a week, but knows that she'll be in a worse state than him, full of guilt and fear. On paper, he has two more weeks to live, but in his gut, he doesn't believe it. He feels in his veins and sinews that they have more time that Laura has time to settle her nerves before facing him. He doesn't grasp where this confidence comes from, but it is there, solid and elemental. It's not that Mahmoud believes himself important. The past few months have torn away that illusion, but he is extraordinary. His life has been extraordinary. The things he has got away with, the things he has been punished for, the things he has seen, the way that it had once seemed possible for him to bend with great force everything to his will. His life was, is, one long film with mobs of extras and exotic expensive sets. Long reams of film and miles of dialogue extending back as he struts from one scene to another. He can imagine how his movie looks even now, the camera zooming in from above onto the cobblestone prison yard and then merging into a close-up of his thoughtful, upturned face, smoke billowing out from the corner of his dark lips. A colour film. It must be that. It is everything. Comedy, music, dance, travel, murder, the wrong man caught, a crooked trial, a race against time, and then the happy ending. The wife swept up in the hero's arms as he walks out, one sun-filled day to freedom. The image stretches Mahmoud's mouth into a smile. I love that passage. It's, um, you know, it resonates and echoes with so many other moments throughout the book. His love of, of, you know, that he knows from the very beginning that he goes to the movies 
too often. Um, yeah. That the night the murder happens, he was at a movie theater, um, and no one, and that's not enough to get um, to get him off. Um, it's a, it's a really beautiful moment in in the book. Um, I was wondering, you know, thinking about his, you know, just about the sort of different echoes that happen then inside of the narrative. There's, you know, obviously the Mahmoud as the central sort of character, but there's of course, you know, the family that's of, of Grace and Violet and Diane um, and the murder that obviously the woman who is murdered, Violet's death in, in the store, in the shop that Mahmoud is accused of. Um, and I was wondering about the construction of those two, because the more I started th seeing them, I was about the ways they obviously diverge, but m more interesting in some ways is almost all the ways in which they sort of quietly intersect. Um, not because they necessarily overlap, but just because when you, it's like you can see these these ways in which their lives talk to one another, right? That he's, you know, his father owned a store, of course, mm -hmm. Violet, the woman is, they inherited a storekeeper from her, a store from her father. Um, they both, of course, end up dead at the end of this story. Um, they both are, come from, you know, religious and minority backgrounds inside of this community. Um, so I'm wondering, yeah, how how that, what it was like to sort of imagine your way into that world and into that sort of, you know, domestic sort of life of these three women living together. Um, and then to oscillate back and forth to, to Mahmoud's reality, which is obviously dramatically different in some ways. Yes, um, and it wasn't something I set out to do. So I intended to concentrate on Mahmoud and Laura, but the more I found out, and it was in this piecemeal, almost as if I was being left these crumbs that I was following um, way that I found out more about the murder victim's family, who were really interesting in their own right, this, this family of women. The men had disappeared and they were living an independent life. Um, in a, in a culture that would have told them that they needed men uh, for protection, for, for money, for their own standing in society, and they decided to go against that. The fact that Diana had also volunteered um, before the Second World War because of what was going on in Germany to the Jewish population was really interesting to me. I thought there was a courage there um, that grabbed my attention. The fact that they didn't um, submit to the police who clearly wanted Mahmoud to just be found guilty and framed for this murder. And they kept denying and, you know, not denying is not the right word. They kept reaffirming the fact that he was not the man they had seen. And I think that took real courage because they also must have just wanted closure, but they were not willing to, to point out the wrong, the wrong man. And I think we've seen, you know, in more recent cases, how, how easy it is for someone to do that when they're traumatized. Um, to just allow the whole thing to to fall on a face, whoever that face belongs to. Yeah, yeah. There's all these, you know, from the very beginning. There's, you know, they're being told that there was a Somali man who did it, and part of me kept wondering, well, how does anybody, do these people, really know what it's like? Would they be able to identify a Somali from a Jamaican, from a West Indian? Um, they thought they and, did, and that, that was a yeah. big thing, actually. Um, the the police detective Harry Power is his real name, who was you know, instrumental in doing all of this. He was really adamant that Somalis had a particular look and he would know them. And so did the victim's family actually. Um, but one of them one of them said she saw what looked like a Somali man and the other one said she thought he looked West Indian. And this is at night, on a rainy night. So how, and with a hat on, you know, I don't think, and I wouldn't be able to tell who's, who's Somali or whatever in that way. Um, so that, that, that feeling of it being a small area where different minorities are really visible, I think that was actually an important part of what happened and also the attitudes that went along with, with that. So Somalis looked like this and behaved like this. Jamaicans looked like this and behaved like that. All of that kind of taxonomy was really yeah. important to the police and to the authorities and I think also became normal within the general population. Yeah, yeah, it becomes a way of kind of organizing, and 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 obviously, you know, taxonomies is is exactly the right um, term. You know, it reminds me of um, I could think it's Berlin who tells him the story of coming to to Germany um, as not knowing why he was sort of there, but that mm -hmm. he had been brought there to actually be caged and to be gawked at and stared at um, like you yeah. know like animals. 
yeah. And if he had died, he could have easily been his had his body stolen and ended up stuffed in a museum or yeah. you know, his bones melted down to be sold. That's what they were dealing with. Yeah. And, and and so that means one of the interesting tensions in this novel is we know as readers, and obviously you knew as the author from the very beginning, where the story was going to end. Mm. You know, the conclusion is to some degree foregone and the tension isn't what happens to the character, it seems, but in some ways, how to sustain Muhammad's sense of life throughout this novel until it goes away, until he's until he's forced to sacrifice it. Mm. Um, and it's this interesting tension where it's almost like the tension is with un, us as the readers, as you know, we're sort of being drawn closer and closer and as the narrative moves deeper into his confinement to the imprisonment is actually when we get to know him even mm. more intimately when we hear his voice and it's like we're being drawn closer to him knowing full well that we're that we're going to lose him at the end of the narrative and it's an interesting so it's an interesting i was wondering what it was like to sort of write that knowing that you know you're asking and and it's i think for me part of the power is actually being asked to care about somebody knowing what the outcome is going to be anyway yes um i think i had a wobble towards the end when i i couldn't cope with what was about to happen to him where i thought oh is it possible that I could change his fate, you know, take that liberty as a, as a writer, but I couldn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a freedom I could take. Um, so, and it was, yeah, for me, there was no mystery about how the real story ended. And I was interested in going as deep as possible and also as wide as possible in his young life. He died in his mid twenties. Um, and he became a really familiar character to me, character to me someone that, I loved, but also had that kind of familial difficulty with. Um, much, you know, with Berlin, I just love him. I find him exciting, I find him funny. Um, but Mahmoud had that tension uh, for me. And I wished he didn't say certain things that he had said in real life or didn't do certain things. But there was that begrudging sense of, well, we're in this together. It doesn't matter if you're always if you're perfect or not, it's just a question of, I'm, I'm on your side. I'm on your yeah. side and I, I will walk with you through that experience. And I guess that's also what I'm asking the, the audience to do or the reader to do is to walk beside him, however yeah. difficult it gets, yeah. to not look away. We, I mean, you know, we all know the conventions, you're supposed to create complicated characters who are morally flawed, etc. Were you nonetheless worried about about doing that with this character, right? The, ch the challenge of representation and representing people from especially our communities where we feel like they're oftentimes, you know, right. not, there's so little, rep yeah, and there's so little representation and what representation there is is oftentimes, and when Muhammad is, he's a fully rich and live complex character, um, but nonetheless, you struggle with like, you know, he's a thief. He steals mm -hmm. from his own mosque. Um, he's married to a white woman. You know, he has, um, you know, you know, in our in all these strikes that might be sort of registered against him, um, you know, and I'm wondering like how how that process was for you of of trying to navigate both trying to be honest to the complexity of his character, but also at the same time, did you worry or or did you feel like you had to consider what does it mean to do that nonetheless? Not given, while I was writing, yeah. while I was writing, I felt very free, you know. It, was, it had been in my mind for so long. Um, and then I started researching it intensely, intensively in 2015. And then I finished the first draft um, towards the end of 2017. And it just came out in one big spurt. <laughs> um, but I think I needed that feeling of no one watching over me, no one, no one having, not having to answer to anyone for, in any way about anything. And it's only, once it's, well, it's published that you start to think about these things um and i think as well maybe my attitude has is not the attitude for some people where they really need to feel good about history they need history and historical individuals to make them feel good make them feel pride or something and i think that's asking too much i think that history kind of smirches everyone we all whoever we are wherever country we come from whatever background we have, there's a lot of shame in, in people's behavior. Um, 
but that doesn't negate everything. Um, so the, the flaws that Mahmoud has are quite small, you know, he's not ever really hurt anyone, but he is flawed. Um, but to demand of him a perfection or goodness to feel any sympathy for him, I think is really dangerous. Um, there are lots of unsympathetic people around us who are very vulnerable at the same time. And how are we meant to relate to them? Yeah. And yet at the same time, you know, as, as you noted earlier, that demand is nonetheless posed to you when people sort of ask, well, if you don't like it, why? You know, if you think it's so bad here, why not leave? If the point of this book is to cast this light on, you know, this terrible thing that happened in, in the history of the country, and that's what you're doing, and that seems to be the sole purpose of the book, then why, you know, why write about it for us? Why not? Um, so how do you, how do you respond to those, those, those critiques that sort of, that that because it's in, in some ways it seems like people sometimes can take that attempt to sort of complicate and complete a narrative project and 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 going into the archives and resurrecting narratives that you know mm. are there to be resurrected. That's what the archives are for, but they're never people aren't necessarily used to being someone like you doing the mm. resurrection. Um, Maybe in the UK, those archives are actually used to bury things, not to resurrect. Yeah. They, they can be extremely hard. I put in a few information, of freedom of information requests on related cases and I generally didn't have any luck. So it can be very difficult to get these, um, I, to access these archives. Um, and there's a lot that was destroyed. You know, when the British were leaving many of their colonies, they would burn everything, all of the paperwork that they had. Um, so you're, you're dabbling or delving into a history that everyone finds quite uncomfortable. I think, you know, when I sometimes post pictures of the human zoos, just say, um, some young Somalis get really upset because they feel that it's humiliating, that I'm somehow celebrating it, um, that it's, it's an ugly piece of history that we should, we should hide. Mm. So that, that to me is sinister. I think uh, whoever you are, whatever your background, there's a responsibility to see things as they as they were and as they are now. Yeah. Um, just a reminder to everybody in the audience: if you have questions, please um, feel free to to put them into the chat, and we'll um, we'll just fold them into the the conversation um, anytime now. Um, as you, I'm you, not you, sure you if know, I answered your question. Well, I, I was going to come back to it actually because because you did it, it, you did actually bring it to an interesting place because I hadn't actually thought about you know the fact that there within that there would be Somalis as well who would actually feel like mm -hmm. resurrecting this history is actually problematic because it reminds them of a certain type of shame that they no longer want to feel yeah. you know but definitely in the in the U.S. we hear that a lot with you know say for example the sixteen nineteen project to go back into history mm -hmm. and and recast the narrative or recast the archives into a different framework seems as if the intent of doing so is to make people feel bad. Yeah. And what's the sort of response to that? Because that doesn't, that isn't the intention, but. No, it's not. Um, and I remember Toni Morrison talking about the hostility that she faced when The Bluest Eye was published, because instead of elevating or uplifting the African-American community, it was seen as, you know, bringing this terrible um, story of incest as being representative of African-American mm. life. Um, and of course it was in the same way that it is in any other community um, possible. So it, it's, it's, it's a thing that I think, you know, writers are often used as, as other artists are as a, as a way of packaging and mythologizing a group or a country and when you stray away from that and you know to speak about Orhan Pamuk speaking about the Armenian genocide in Turkey just say or me suggesting that some of the Somali sailors were probably gay you know this goes against what they think is your purpose and once you don't have that purpose well then you're just a problem um, and I, I know in Somalia that writers regularly get in trouble for, for small things more obvious you know, problems that they've caused. Um, and there's a feeling that they should be 
they should be under the thumb of either the community or of the authorities. So, I, I mean, so the, and then in that regard too, the, you know, the work of this novel isn't, it's, it's, it's complicating everything in everyone, right? There's enough, Absolutely. yeah. Mm. And so everyone, so even those who might sort of say, well, why are you writing about this, about this sort of British history? And you can easily sort of look at say, well, actually the, the poor, no one's, no one's a saint and no one is obviously, um, yeah. there's obviously more blame um, in certain institutional powers without a doubt. Yes. Um, yeah, but you're yeah. not, you're not there to pass judgment on just one. That's not what you're doing there. No, and it was clear that the, the Muslim community let Mahmoud down. They, they yeah. really didn't like him, and so they didn't go very far in trying to support him. So it wasn't, and also I was surprised actually how many black men betrayed him. Most of the, not most, but quite a few of the important prosecution witnesses were black. Um, including the chief prosecution witness who lied and said that he was the man he'd seen outside of the shop at the time of the murder. And that, that was something that surprised me. Yeah. Um, there's a question from, um, there's no name, but an anonymous attendee. Um, <laughs> in your research, did you encounter things you wanted to work into the novel, but were unable to? And if so, could you share any of that? Sure, yes, definitely. So the novel was 600 pages at first draft, so I lost a good chunk of it. Um, one of the main things that I lost um, was a background to the political and social life of, of men like Mahmoud. So Mahmoud was pretty apolitical, but the men around him were not. So you had communists, you had anti-colonialists, you had um, radicals of different descriptions. It was a real hive of um, anti, authoritarian action, really. Um, so one of them was called Duala, and he, he, he still appears briefly in the novel. And he was someone who uh, was a communist and was being followed constantly by special branch um, because they, they knew he was up to, up to something. They're the, I, I don't know how you'd, would they be the FBI maybe in the US? Um, you, you had this, uh, religious conflict between more Sufi practitioners and the more strict hardline Salafi style Muslims. And they would have these battles and in one battle, the police were called because they were literally brawling outside of the main mosque and um, all of this kind of politics, which to me is very, I thought very modern, was present there um, all those decades ago. So a lot of that background, the political history, I guess, had to go. Thank you for the question. I, I, I was just looking through, um, as you were uh, talking about the special branch of the authorities, and um, there's one particular moment that I was very fond of on uh, 87, when you um, move into Powell's head and, and reflections yeah. as he's um, sort of trying to sum up his experience with or his encounter with uh, Mahmoud and, and where his mind moves from there because there's, he starts off in one place and yet you do this really interesting job of navigating all of the things that that encounter with him provokes in his consciousness. And it's an interesting sort of sequence of, of thoughts and emotions that flow out from there that says a lot both about him, but also ultimately about um, the UK's understanding and relationship to this community in Tiger Bay. And I was wondering if you could just, it's only, a, a, you know, let, maybe just like a page long if you could read it. Sure. Do you know which page it is? Yeah, it's on um, 87, starting with smoking his pipe and pacing up and down the dark hallway. Okay. There's going to be some offensive language in this book. Smoking his pipe and pacing up and down the dark hallway, Powell collects his thoughts. Matan is wilder than he expected. A real rogue with no, res with no respect for the... Oh, I'll say that again. Matan is wilder than he expected. A real rogue with no respect for authority. A covetous darkie of no fixed abode. He'd read somewhere 
that for Somalis, every man is his own master. They ain't like the jovial crew boys or anglicized West Indians, but are truculent and vicious, quick to draw a weapon and unrepentant after the fact. This one must have become bold after the soft sentences he'd received in the past. Remember to wear gloves, dispatch the victim without a peep, dispose quickly of the murder weapon and stolen cash. Dangerous, but now unable to keep his lies straight. A good substantial case. Something his, something his son should be helping out on instead of faffing around in writing college, wasting his time on amateur dramatics, civics and English literature. What does an expect to need of all that gobbledygook? The police service is surely losing its way. He's been in the job gone 30 years and he's learned everything he's needed to know by thinning his boots out on the streets, talking to the dregs of society, knowing their habits better than they do, holding your dinner down when confronted with their bestial acts. That's the knack to this job. Not to say that there isn't some place for book learning, forensics, but it's still down to that relentless knowledge and pursuit of the wolves who live within the flock. The perverts, lunatics, desperados, love fools, sadists, and Jacqueline Hydes that he's interviewed and shared a, cig and shared a cigarette with before sending them on to the gallows. It's usually the sluts and nigger lovers that bear the brunt of it, shot down if they're lucky, or dragged naked out of a blood-soaked ditch if they're not. Respectable women, like Miss Falaki, should be inviolable, must be. He'd known her for decades, known her father too. She was a minuscule woman, wouldn't even reach as high as his chest. Obviously not a Christian, but sober, industrious, and straight as a die. Tiger Bay needed people like her, otherwise it would go completely to the docks. He'd catch her killer, he was sure of that. He didn't need the papers or the counselors hurrying him. They'd spoken to every seaman doc that night, every pub landlord, every thief, every dopehead, every whore, the milkmen and road sweepers, the shopkeepers and cafe owners, the pastors and sheikhs, the money lenders and their debtors, the street dice throwers and the kids who watched them, and to police forces across the country. If the local cats, dogs and horses could talk, he would have pulled them in for questioning too. The younger men might get excited working in docks, but for him, it was just depressing what the country had come to. Spending almost every night this past fortnight on the bay had disheartened him. It was crawling with queers, darkies, hoodlums, communists, and traitors of every description. You could smell the dissolution in the air from the oily stink of spices pumping out of the eating houses to the wisps of marijuana smoke coming from loud house parties. Was this the country that so many good men and boys had died for? The ports are our broken skin. That's what his first chief constable had said way back in the twenties. And it was still true. No one had listened when Wilson suggested outlawing mixed race marriages then. And here lay the consequences. Footsteps clatter towards Powell, and he raises his head from the floor. Sir, Monday is here to see you. Good, good. Bring him in and call in that useless Jamaican Cova. He said that asylum case, Tahir Gas, was a Somali he saw outside the shop, didn't he? Yes, sir. Well, let's see if we can't jog his memory a little bit. Gas has already hot-footed it onto a ship. Thank you. Um... I love that passage, especially that line, the, po the ports are our broken skin. Um, and so many of the sentiments that come there, they feel so strangely uh, familiar right now. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions that I want to try to uh, get to. Um, from Andy, um, can you tell us more about your experience researching um, Tiger Bay and who you were able to interview and connect with there? Sure, thanks, Andy. So I went quite a few times back and forth to Cardiff, uh, to Tiger Bay. And I managed to speak to Mahmoud's granddaughter, Berlin's son, the murder victim's niece, a Somali sailor who'd known Mahmoud from the 1940s onwards. In fact, it has gone to he'd been with him on his wedding day. And then they had traveled 
across um, the world on a ship together in 1947. And then people in London, people in Somaliland. It was very eerie one night when I was in Hargeisa and my first night there, someone recognized me as, as, the, as a writer and got talking and I asked him what his name was and he said Mahmoud Matan. And he said that he was a relative of the Mahmoud Matan that I was researching. And that felt as if, you know, there was something strange, um, strangely uh, kismity about that. But Cardiff is somewhere that I think you have to keep unpeeling unpe layers. It's based on trust. And, hello? Okay, so I'm on low battery. Um, <laughs> so, it was only about the personal relationships I could build while there, generally through the Somali community that I was able to, to meet these people. Um, a question from uh, Jedediah. Um, thank you so much for your beautiful words in the diva. Did you write the story first, then fit historical facts into the novel, or did you have research done? What approach would you recommend for someone looking to write a historical murder mystery? I don't know if I'm qualified to give advice, but I can tell you how I did it. Um, and for me, I need quite a lot of research already done before I feel confident about starting something. I feel like I've got to hit a critical mass and it, there's no, there's no, I can't say what that critical mass is, but you feel it. And that's when you get, you get kind of loose with, with the facts because you feel like you know everything. Um, and it's not, it's not a process that stops. So I researched a lot and started writing and kept researching, especially things that I felt I still didn't know or needed more on. So um, I can't imagine writing it as fiction and then putting the facts in, but that, that wouldn't work for me. There's also a moment that, that um, actually let me jump to this question um, here. Um, have there been differences between the ways the books has been, have, has been received in Wales versus the UK versus the US? Hmm. Well, in Wales, it feels very personal. I've received a lot of support from Welsh readers, um, Welsh newspapers. It's amazing to talk to the newspapers that reported on that case in the 1950s. So I think I've had a really lovely and warm response from Wales. Um, from the UK, something that's interesting is that I'm, it's, the book has reached an audience that I don't think my other novels did of older British men who are either interested in law, interested in history, and are still moved by the story. That's been really interesting. Um, and I think maybe it's too early for me to know how it's been received in the US. Um, but in the UK, it's, it's been quite interesting because I think that it's only a very small minority who have rejected it. Um, most ridiculously of all, there was, a, there was a protest outside the Booker Prize against my novel by a far-right organization that thought that my novel was bringing disrepute to Britain or something stupid like that. Um, but they, they were two men with placards, so <laughs> I think I can, I can let it go. Um, there's a, another question. I really appreciated what you said about the women, Mary and Margaret. It seems like it would be so easy to simply portray them as bad, but of course it's so much more complicated than that. More people than Mahmoud were powerless. Would you be able to speak mm -hmm. on that a bit more? Absolutely, I completely agree with that. And what happened in the 1950s was replicated in the late 80s, early 90s in Cardiff, where three black and, Asian, black and mixed race men were sentenced for a murder they had nothing to do with at all. And they spent a few years in prison before the convictions were quashed. Um, and in that case, when you look at all of the different characters involved, all of them were vulnerable, either with learning disabilities or um, there were sex workers who were threatened with having their children taken away from them. One of them was told, well, you know what they do to mixed race children in care, don't you? Really nasty stuff. And, um, Margaret and Mary, they were, they were terrified. And one of the things that struck me in the archive was how long they kept one of them in, in the, the police station for the interview and they kept calling her back. So that pressure that they applied to people, especially in a poor community like that, where people generally didn't have a great education, had probably had some run-ins in the law, with the law in some way, the police could run amok and they did. 
And you're very right, it was Mahmoud was not the only vulnerable person that they were abusing. Yeah, even in the, the passage that you read, you you can do this wonderful job of moving so deep into, you know, sort of Powell's consciousness where you can see the ways in which he can try to justify and explain, you know, his version of the world, right? In which the, on the one side, there is only these, you know, sort of derelicts of society. And then there's the decency, which he represents, which he wants to pass on to his son, right? It's almost yeah. like a legacy that um, he wants to make sure gets inherited. Yeah. And he, and he in turn has inherited it. And one of the phrases yeah. that he used, a covetous starkey of no fix the boat, was something I read in the Old Bailey archive from the 1700s it's, yeah. about a black man who had been soliciting for sex on Regent Street and had then robbed the man that he had gone back back with or robbed the man's employer because he was a butler. Um, and these characters who were living these wild lives and being seen in exactly the same way in the 1700s, there's a chain, there's a chain on both sides. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, an, it's a legacy. It's an, a type of strange sort of inheritance um, in, in, across multiple generations and, and in multiple ways. Um, so thank you for that. So beautiful noted. Um, I don't see if there's any other final questions. I think we might have time for one more, but um, perhaps not. Um, um, in which case, I think, I believe, um, Sarah, our wonderful host, Hi. will take over. Thank you again to Nadifa and Danao for your time tonight discussing Nadifa's beautiful novel, The Fortune Men. Um, and thank you to the audience all for tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and an incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. If you would like to support Nadifa and the bookstore, click the link in the chat to purchase The Fortune Men. We sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Janelle. You. Thank you. Wonderful to talk to you again, Nadifa. Thank you. Um, yeah, make sure all everyone out there buys this wonderful book out there. <laughs> <laughs>